Hey folks, before we get into today's podcast, I wanted to let you know about our upcoming QCon software development conferences. We will be back in person at QCon London this April 4 to 6 and online with the QCon Plus May 10 to 20. Join the world's most innovative senior software engineers across multiple domains in person and online as they share their real world implementation of emerging trends and practices. You can learn more about the events at qconferences.com. We hope to see you there. Good day, folks. This is Shane Hasty for the InfoQ Engineering Culture Podcast. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with Jyoti Bansai. Jyoti, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Good, yeah, Shane. Great to be here. So you are the founder and CEO of Harness, who are a CD company. Tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you to where you are today, and a little bit about Harness, please. My background, I'm a software engineer by training, by profession. You know, I build software systems, you know, complex software systems. At some point of time, I was really frustrated by that you can't monitor and troubleshoot what's happening in software. Like you build these distributed systems and things go wrong and you couldn't figure out what's happening. Back in 2008, I started AppDynamics, which eventually became one of the leading players in application monitoring, application performance monitoring APM space. And AppDynamics, we sold to Cisco kind of famously a day before our IPO. We were about to just go IPO and a day before they came in and bought AppDynamics. And once AppDynamics was acquired by Cisco, you know, I got really frustrated by another problem, which is that everyone is struggling with CI, CD, DevOps. You know, we are all trying to ship software fast. You know, we were trying to do that AppDynamics ourselves, and we were really not doing a good job at it. And I would talk to most of AppDynamics customers, and I'll hear the same story, that people were struggling with shipping software. And, you know, that became the genesis of Harness. I was looking for the next set of major problem for the software engineering organizations that we need to tackle. And, you know, that became Harness, that how do we go and simplify software delivery processes and software delivery systems? So that's what Harness does. You know, Harness is trying to build sort of an end-to-end software delivery platform where your developers, you know, write code. And then what happens after that from like, you know, building and testing the code to deploying the code, deploying the infrastructure, you know, verifying the code works, you know, if something doesn't work, you roll it back, all aspects of software delivery. What we are trying to do is like, instead of you trying to cobble things together by scripting and hiring a lot of, you know, bespoke different systems together, putting them all together, that can you have a consistent platform to build a software delivery pipeline. And at Harness, we started with CD as the first part of that puzzle. Like, you know, there are so many aspects of like, you know, how do you build and ship software? And you hear CI, CD, and it always kind of bothered me that people would use the word CI, CD as one single word, even though like they're two separate things. When you're in CI, you are building and uh, the code and making sure it's integrated with your primary code base. And CD, you're taking that, that whatever you change all the way to your consumers. And you're doing that, you know, actively multiple times a day. And so the first thing we did was to decouple CI and CD and say, let's focus on the CD problem and really bring to market something that solves the CD problem of shipping code to production multiple times a day in a reliable, repeatable manner. So that's where Harness started with. And Harness is a very strong CD product in the market. That's our core strength. But we have been also expanding beyond CD to now CI, the next set of challenge, feature flags. And we also have a fourth module around cloud cost management and bringing cloud cost management into the DevOps CI CD process. What are the biggest challenges with DevOps today? Well, the biggest problem with DevOps today is the velocity is extremely high that is expected out of the software engineering organizations. And the DevOps model of like, you know, there is a team of DevOps engineers, they're trying to bring together these kind of your delivery systems, CI CD processes, pipelines, that becomes a big bottleneck everywhere because people are trying to home grow DevOps systems. You know, the DevOps was always about, you know, you have culture and you have tools. You know, I think on the culture front, we have made a lot of progress that people have embraced and adopted that, you know, you need to put an effort towards shipping software fast. You want to be nimble, you want to be agile, you have to be the right kind of architecture. The tools front, you know, we have not made a good progress. So because of that, like most people, the only path to success is to build things yourself. Like, you know, I look at companies, like say, if you hire a VP of sales in a business and the VP of sales will say, I want to bring the best tools for my salespeople. 
and they can go and buy the best tools and in a month they have the tools and they can now start differentiating on like you know how to do the selling and the sales process etc but the tools are there you can buy now in a month and get going that's not the case for devops our software engineers have the best tools available to do their job their experience is the best let's get them there if we are culturally ready we are architecturally ready with microservices and cloud native but let's bring the best tools it's just not possible like you have to build your own stuff and it takes 2 years and then things change like you know you move from one architecture to another and then things break that you built and that to me is a fundamental problem that for the next level we need to get to the point where the way a pp of sales can buy best tools for their sellers and become at the same place as anyone else when it comes to tools or a vp of hr can buy the tools for hr and get going fast we need to get to the same place for the industry to really move to the next level as devops if you for the engineers sitting in that space where they are pulling things together themselves and so forth what should they be focusing on when it comes to maybe this is the developer experience creating yeah. that space i think developer experience is the number one thing that every organization and every engineering team should focus on and developer experience starts with like you know how do people write code you know how do they commit code you know then how long they have to wait for their ci and builds to run that's a big part of developer experience like many of the times you would see engineers frustrated because builds are taking too long or builds are broken or builds don't work then once you start getting into like you know once something is built you want to deploy and if the deployments are failing or you know or deployments need to be troubleshooted you know there is a big impact on developer experience i think everything when people think of devops should be thought in terms of developer experience is what i fundamentally believe in so a lot of the times when you look at the tools and you know the tool chain that you need to build out that has to be designed with that in mind like how do you optimize for developer experience that they can focus on innovating on the code they are innovating and the tool chain after that is flexible it's simple it can work for you know the process that you want to do to ship that code right but at the same time you also want to remove a lot of the toil that the developers have to go through like you know maybe from a, they have to generate a compliance report or someone is asking for an audit trail we work with companies where people say like we have to provide a audit trail of all the changes and deployments we did once a month and that's a four day process for our engineering team to go and compile that right so that kind of unnecessary toil creates a bad developer experience like in developers are wasting their time the data points that we see in a customer base from hard is about 20 to 30% of developer time is wasted on unnecessary things think of like you know build deployments troubleshooting compliance reporting all of those kind of the toil that comes with that and if you think of like 20 30% waste that's a massive waste for everyone you know and no developer likes to do it and how do you optimize that is how i think is how we should be thinking of it I'm going to challenge that and say from the organization's perspective that compliance report is crucial because without it we could be shut down. Yeah. So that compliance report is crucial but do you need to spend 4 days in generating that compliance report or that could be done in 4 minutes through some kind of automated way is really where how you improve the developer experience like right? you know so that's where right now there is so much pain and toil involved in these kind of things compliance report is essential you want to win put more security gates and more quality gates and more you know your software supply chain protection and all sort of things and the higher the velocity is you know we will need more protection but the problem is like if you put all of that burden on the engineers to do through manual toil all by writing a lot of scripts the engineering experience becomes very very complex like you know there is so much frustration in engineers now is like we spend so much of our time not just writing code and innovating on all sort of things which is important and that's is how devops will work like you can't just offload it to someone else but we need to give them tools to automate most of it and the tools not just automate the process but also more intelligent tools like so that's why when i look at the next generation of devops tooling it's all about intelligence like say if you look at just ci for example right you know ci for 15 years have been about the same like you know since first time jenkins was written it's mostly more or less around the same which is like you compile your code and you know you run a whole bunch of tests and over time people have created a lot of testing and test frameworks and test suites so you have like i say imagine if you have a code base of a million lines it is not that big of a code base someone makes like you know 50 lines of code change and the 50 lines of code change you have a test suite of 4000 tests which will be very common most of the times in your ci you want to do like let's test everything you will run a suite of 4000 tests and see like for those 50 lines of code changes does anything break that to me is not an intelligent way of doing it because that's causing the developer to wait for that 4000 tests to run to check everything 
you know, can you use some ML and intelligence to figure out what are the most important tests out of the 4,000 tests for the 50 line of code change that just happened? Right. So that kind of intelligence allows to, you know, higher developer productivity. And so, you know, at Anas, you know, those are some of the algorithms that we're bringing to the market. We have one thing called, which we just brought into the market called test intelligence, which is about that. Like, can we learn from the dependency models between your code and your test tests? Like which part of code should invoke what test and what are important and can we run them in the right order? Maybe out of the 4,000 tests, you only need 200 to run for the code changes you just did. That can bring down the time to test by 60, 70, 80%, right? So now the developer has to wait for less period. So I would say like, you have to achieve that. Like there's no answer to that. Let's not test enough. We don't want developers to wait. So let's cut down the testing. That's not the answer. Like, can we be smarter about it? Can we be more intelligent about how we do things? Same thing applies to compliance. Same thing applies to security. You know, that we have to get more smarter because developers are wasting otherwise too much of their time in doing these things. What is that? smartness look like in compliance and security? The smartness looks like in compliance and security is around governance policies, which is like, you know, you have like things like OPA, you know, open policy agent these days or frameworks like where you can enforce policies, right? So what policies do is they allow to create the guardrails. So you want developers to move fast, do whatever you need to do, but there will be guardrails that you cannot break. By definition, you're compliant because the guardrails define the compliance. So instead of like, you know, trying to figure out like, you know, were you compliant after the fact, like a week later or bringing a lot of like, you know, change management processes in it, you can automate the compliance guardrails. Like you say, which say, let's say, unless you run security scans on your code change that you just did. And as part of your security scanning, there should not be any new vulnerability of certain kind that was discovered. You know, unless you do that, the pipeline will stop and you cannot deploy in production. Can you automate that process? You know, if you automate that in an intelligent, smart way, you can remove a lot of the burden later on for like people trying to manually figure it out. Like, did we create more vulnerability? You know, someone generating a compliance report to give to the compliance team on what happened after these deployments. All of this stuff could be automated through a policy framework that you can make it part of your CICD process and the CICD pipeline that makes the pipeline compliant now just by that framework in place. So if I am the DevOps engineer thinking about the developer experience and wanting to improve the metrics, the outcomes for the engineers that I support, what are the things I should be focusing on? How do I start? It would be a simple answer if there was like only one variable, like, but the why the job of DevOps is hard or any software engineering team who are responsible for an app, because you have like five or six different dimensions. Right? You have the dimension of velocity that is, you have to ship fast. You don't want to slow down anything. You have the quality dimension. Everything has to be high quality. There's a security dimension that security and governance that people have to, you know, you have, you can't create a security gap. You have to have the compliance, governance, all of that has to come in there. And then there is the dimension of resiliency, like that everything has to be resilient. You know, you have to be able to roll back fast if something breaks. And then finally, there is cost. And cost is also a very important factor. Like, you know, people used to not worry about it, like, you know, the DevOps teams, but now everything is running in a public cloud and the public cloud, you do a few things and your cloud bill can go up millions of dollars quickly. So it's like, now you have to balance those five, like, you know, your velocity, quality, resiliency, security, and cost. So you have to build things where like, you know, your pipeline should automate most of these things. Like you have to bring more and more inside the pipelines and just automate that through like, you know, what is your cost cost model? Let's say you're deploying new code or new microservices or new something and new changes. Does your cloud cost go up? You know, or before you even deploy, can something predict and tell like, you know, if you make this change, you know, this is what the impact on your cloud cost will be. And now, so you stop the change or you go through an approval flow and you just automate that as part of some kind of governance system. If instead of that, like, you know, how it happens today is like you ship something a week later or a month later, someone figures out like, you know, your cloud bill have went, went up. Then you spend like a two weeks to troubleshoot, like, why did your cloud bill go up? And then someone comes in and then like, you know, they are putting the hammer down on the DevOps teams on like, let's go and fix this thing. But you could go and fix it right there as part of the automated pipeline. You know, cost is like that. Your security governance, I already talked about the example like that. You know, you could be much more intelligent in many of these factors and convert it to then metrics of like, you know, what cost is allowed for what microservice, what team, you know, and then you run and you give them the framework to operate in, you know, what are the quality metrics? What are the security policies, governance policies? The more you can define things for developers in well-defined metrics and guardrails, 
you know, the developers can operate into that. I'll give you an example of the error budget concept that Google uses, where like, you know, there's an error budget that every team is given. Like, you know, this is error budget, yes, which is like, you know, you can have 10 minutes of, let's say, availability issue in a certain period, or you can have this percentage of your user interactions could have an error. And so now the team is has an error, clearly defined error budget. And as long as they operate in the error budget, they can go and make a changes, a lot of changes and do a lot of things. You know, if you deplete your error budget, you have to wait. So I would say the more you can define these clearly defined concepts. So now I would think of a DevOps team. It's great. Like, you know, if you give them the error budget and say like, you know, if you are meeting your error budget, you can go and ship your pipelines, can go and ship things and deploy things. But if you're not meeting your error budget, you have to slow down your pipeline and wait until you meet your SLAs and error budget requirements. Same thing applies with security and governance. Same thing applies with cost. You just have to create a framework that's a little bit less ad hoc and more automated and more metrics and goals oriented. Where do the accelerate metrics come into this? Accelerate metrics are a great part of this. You know, you have the time to ship, you know, you have the deployment frequency, you know, time to roll back or resolve if something goes wrong. All of those are extremely important. And I think that's how we should be looking at it. Like, you know, Accelerate is a great framework and the metrics are a great framework of looking at how a software engineering organization is operating. I do think there are a few more metrics there that are needed to complete the picture. Cost is a clear dimension. Security and governance is a clear dimension that's not fully covered into those. And so it could be expanded into some additional metrics. Changing direction a little bit. Talking about your own experience, you were saying to me earlier on that Parnas has experienced phenomenal growth over the last year. You've gone from 100 to 500 people. Now, this has been over the period of COVID with lockdowns and so forth. Yeah. Not just last year, the last couple of years. Last couple of years. So how has that growth been managed and how has that worked for you and for the organization as a whole? This is the Culture Podcast, particularly around retaining the organization culture. If you grow that much, like, you know, when majority of the organization is new and it just came in and during the time of covid and remote work and pandemic you know culture is definitely a challenge you have to be more deliberate about it is the primary thing like what culture do you want that's the most important thing and then how do you make that culture happen or measure is that happening or not i do think the important part when you go through that kind of a growth you know if you look at just from an engineering culture perspective the main thing from engineering culture is modularization and clear responsibility and accountability. That's right? where you can break things into smaller areas, components, microservices, you know, so the teams that are responsible for a certain service and with clear APIs. So APIs become your primary endpoints of, you know, how you operate and engage and how you define service levels. What it that creates, it creates independence. It creates, you know, accountability, it creates a way to measure things and people to operate independently as well, right? The second part is a lot of, I would say, measurability. Measurability in the process is very key, like, you know, that people can know, you know, what are the metrics starting from accelerate kind of metrics to your service level objectives to your security governance, all kind of metrics that are needed that people have to operate in a framework of that. So then people can communicate around that framework. That is important. I look at the culture beyond engineering as well. Like, you know, when you look at the broader company culture, what kind of culture do you want? I do think like for very high growth companies, the best culture is everything wide open and transparent. So you treat everyone as sort of an equal partner in what you're doing and, you know, good, bad, ugly, you share everything. The advantage of that is like, you know, it just creates much more alignment. Like there is like no layers of information, hierarchy of anything like that. It's like whatever is good is shared, whatever is bad is shared, whatever is ugly is shared. And Harness, we make it all the dashboards of everything, you know, that's happening in the company are all available to all employees. We share them, we show them, everything is open. It just makes it easier for new people to come in and get on the same page because they all have access to the same information. And I'm generally a big believer, like, you know, the more information is shared between teams, the more people know, especially in a high growth kind of environment, that it really helps the culture. How are you tackling or are you tackling the remote versus in-person, the quote unquote hybrid workspaces there? We are tackling it like anyone else. Like before COVID, we were not primarily remote work, work from home kind of company. We had a very strong, vibrant office culture. We had offices in San Francisco, Mountain View, in Dallas, in India, in Bangalore. So we were mostly office oriented. But with COVID, obviously, we became remote work. But we really embraced the remote work. Actually, we, we won an award for one of the best remote work companies, you know, number two in the tech startup space a few months ago. 
And what we embraced is like, it's great. Like, you know, we have access to talent everywhere. People have flexibility to work from anywhere. So we have embraced the work from anywhere as the forever culture, you know, so no one is required to come to office. You can work from home, work from anywhere. But at the same time, we do provide offices as well for people who do want to come to office to have that social interaction. So our rule is like, you know, in any particular city or city or like a geography close by, if we have about, you know, 10 to 15 people who want to come to an office sometimes, we get them an office. So we still have an office in Mountain View, an office in San Francisco, and a few more offices we are opening where. So people have like, they want to come to office once a week or twice a week or interact or, you know, some people do prefer to come to office, you know, so they have that option to come to office. So we don't require anyone to come to office, but people have that option. And, you know, people come in for like, you know, social interaction, people come for happy hours, people come for like, you know, team meetings, people come for brainstorming, whiteboarding as they wish. So it becomes a hybrid thing. And I do think that's how it would be forever. And there are a few elements that you have to become much more careful about when you're doing fully remote work, which is you have to make sure that, you know, that the bonding between people and the camaraderie, there are forums that you create, you know, even virtually for people to interact. Like, you know, when you're in the office, that just happens naturally. Like, you know, that you just have like the non-work interaction that just happens naturally. If you're on Zoom all the time, there is no time for non-work interactions at all. So you almost have to, as a company, you have to create those situations where something happening, which is non-work interaction that's there. The other thing that we had to be very careful and we had some challenges around it is geographical distribution. Now with people working from anywhere means that people are in different time zones, people are in different geographies. So how do you operate into that without creating a burden for people to communicate on a call all the time or on a video call in different time zones? So more communication that's asynchronous. You know, we adopted this concept called squads and every squad is in one time zone, really. So the most of the work could happen in one time zone. So we put like, say, a squad of like three to five engineers, they normally would be in one time zone. So most of the day-to-day interaction they have, they don't have to do with engineers in another time zone. So it creates a rhythm, you know, they don't have to do calls at early mornings or late nights. So those are the things you have to be careful about. And we all had to adapt. And the good thing is, I feel like organizations have done well adapting to this new world of how work would be. We're coming to the end, looking back over your career and you've been really successful, what advice would you give the new engineer and what should they be looking at today? My advice is like, you know, I take a lot of pride in the craft of software engineering. That's what my passion is, like building good software, building products that solve big problems. And I'm an entrepreneur and a business person, but at the core of it, I really look at like, you know, if I'm solving good, interesting problems and building good software to do that everything else will happen. So that's the one advice I give to people. Like, don't worry too much about things. If you can build really good software, software that's solving some good problems that people care about, and you take pride in it, then everything can fall in place around it. Many times I see like software engineers like chasing, I want to work on this tag, or I want to work on that tag, or I want to do certain things. I'd normally advise people is like, you know, focus on problem that you're passionate about and building good technology and good solutions and good software to solve those problems. And if you do that, you know, and you take pride in that, monetization around that will happen and business success will happen and, you know, your career success will happen because you delivered something of value. And that's normally my advice to like a young software engineer. Thank you very much indeed. If people want to continue the conversation, where do they find you? LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, my Twitter profile is Jyoti Bansal SF and anyone can Google me and find me on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thanks so much.